field that looks like from a single star. That's what you would just think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think like that, so that, that whole system would then go out somewhat like a typical way to be, you know, like a mass, and then you can peel off those layers and slow it to the torus. Down there, we see some sort of something. So that makes sense. Yeah. But you're, you're right, I mean, it goes down the center, so there's some material up there, I mean, there's some sort of nucleus, is this constraints that you could emit in the surface? I don't know. But, um, but then it just it goes about its normal lifetime, and then so, and, and, and the strength of this field was of the order of megagas at the right. end of the line. Okay. Now, there, are, there is another slight complication too that you could prepare the field in the way that it So, um, you know, you just keep piling material on top of it, that gets incorporated in the window. So, probably what other fields comes out. I'm implicitly assuming that you don't care at all. So, your final word is it could be the single star field. Uh, as if it's not the star now single because this one is gone, right? Right. Uh, that we are observing in the cases of some of these our observations with the mass magnetic fields. Uh, does it make sense with the um, with the quantity? So is it if it's megagauss on the anchor point out to the surface, it has to be just of the order of the oh, you're saying, yeah, you know, like the uh, Bowser is some of these water fountain stuff, is that what you're asking? I'm just asking, I think that's I'm kind of in the top of my head, but is it, yeah, is it going to be a house yeah. on the surface? Well, I remember looking at those a while ago and thinking, Well, I think it's so possibly <laughs> more <laughs> it It's four orders of magnitude, so you know, ten to the nine in scale, ten to the nine, ten to the thirteen on the surface. So if the closest one were R, then it would be you know a hundred times if it's R squared, it's nine by another factor. So it depends on how the scale is. Just try to a couple of ignorant questions, I guess. Um, so, what is the free? Is it a free fall time for the planet when it plunges towards the center, or is it slow? Oh no, I, I would say it's 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 basically typical of continental of so there's there's a spiral time that, that's associated with that, which you know, carries people to debate how long that takes. But I, I would guess it would be something like a year, a year, a year, but fast. Okay. Another question is. Um, are you sure that the planet will remain intact? No, 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 I think the planet won't remain intact. So that's, that's no, I mean even way before reaching the core. Oh, yeah, so there's been some people who've looked at possibly evaporating the planet. Um, and those calculations kind of peel off the, the upper layer of the planet. But the thing is the planet has a very, there's a very symmetric gradient. If you want to fully evaporate the planet, you have to transport that heat down to the center of the planet, which I think is very hard to do. Um, but even if you could do that, there should be some planets maybe have cores or something and they're not going to do that. So I think it's, I think it's not like that. Yes. Just one point just for discussion is, so now that we are getting towards the ability to perhaps model the um, common envelope phase or more of the binary interaction, I guess I want to open up to people like, what should we be doing? Right? I mean, there's this whole, this, what's interesting is that I think there's a lot more questions than there are researchers along uh, these lines. So I guess, you know, I just want to go open up to the community about what, you know, part of this speaks to this question is about linking observations with what we can do in theory. But now that we can run the simulations over the next five years, we're probably, you know, really going to be able to model aspects of both disk formation on you know, for wide binaries, disk formation for uh, the Roche lobe overflow and then actually on an envelope evolution, what are the open questions? Well, I guess uh, there's some, something to be done is trying to link the binary orbit with uh, different parameters, so by some masses, etc., to the large scale morphologies, the variety of morphologies. <coughs> Well, the hard thing about that is that we've had so many scales. Um, this goes to the point sort of that Bruce and uh, Vincent were talking about. Like, so, so 
you know, even with adaptive mesh refinement, it's hard to go, if we're doing a common envelope simulation, it's going to be hard to get out to the nebular scales. Um, so can we find things that, if we're doing simulations that are about, um, uh, you know, the, the binary interactions, what, you know, what perhaps on smaller scales, either smaller scales or what can, you know, the whole morphology may be different, uh, or maybe difficult to model, but maybe is it something about the, the um, imprint of um, instabilities on the surface, right? I mean, the, you know, um, actually one thing that maybe along those lines might be what we could get from the small scale models are the frequency of uh, precession in the disk, right? If we can link that to it. So I don't think we're going to be able to make, at least right now, not this generation of code, that we're going to be able to make direct links between the simulations and the large scale morphology. But if we can find hooks in the large scale morphology that reach down to the smaller scales, that would be good. But other than what is you know, that's, that's my thing. Can you swallow up So I think the large scale morphology depends on the action of the threats or how many outflows on the surrounding material. And unless you can link what has happened to the center to the properties of the jet you're following, you can never solve the problem. So the jets, that might be a place because if, you know, uh, the central engines are controlling, like I said, so the precession or the mass loss of the episodes, that may be a place where we can answer, we get the frequency of episodic ejection. Or the, you know, even if we can't model what it looks like on the large scales, we can, the central engine becomes the input for models on the large scale, like the, the boundary conditions. But I mean, at the very least, if you could predict, but that requires jet theory and accretion is what is the mass flux in the jet? What is the velocity? Well, I hope that's what the right. That's that kind of thing. I think we're heading towards. And even like in the stuff that Martin showed today, and uh, um, you know, we're actually getting the mass flux through onto the disk. And so then, hopefully, soon we'll be able to link that to an MHD model in you know, to MHD actually launch jets off these things. So we'll that would be the yeah. That would be the long way yes. Yes, one thing on the on the binary systems. If I understand correctly, there are some <coughs> systems in which the components actually merge uh, after some some time, and then, then after I don't know after having um, uh, done their effect on the shaping of the nebula, and then it becomes just like one single component. And then for those systems, how are we going to know? that there was actually a binary system. I mean, if, if we see them afterwards and we just see one single star in the center, how would we know that there was a binary system and, and that, yes, it was responsible for the shaping in those cases? Hello. Uh, uh, answering your question, what we need to know is um, under what conditions are we actually expelling the envelope? That's something we don't know. Are we going to expel it? How are we going to expel it? What shape is it going to take? Because many of the assumptions we make are based on that we are expelling actually the other one is going to be panicking and that sort of stuff. And then on what sort of, sort of uh, conditions um, the orbit is going to go, it's going to shrink and go as, as, as close to the, the primary star as we need it to produce wind, rotation overflow, whatever it takes. That's not clear. That's the last part of the calculation is what has, uh, hasn't been done yet. Also, I don't think my information. So, <laughs> an answer to the, well, rotation rates would be great, right? Uh, they're very hard to do in central stars in the end because they have broad lines, they have variable lines. Uh, but uh, there was one in my poster, it's not done by ourselves, it's, it's a cited from another paper. They did uh, the rotation rate through variability and they got a rotation rate of 50 kilometers per second, which is extremely fast. Um, I know that uh, Thomas Rauch had looked at rotation rates of PG 59 stars. I still remember this poster, I don't know if it was in a paper, showing that they were systematically higher than other objects for which they could do it, but it's not easy to do. And I have a quick, a quick question for Adam. Adam, so it's true you can simulate the large scales of PN in a common envelope simulation. But then we talked about this in the past. But what if you uh, simulate out to a certain um, uh, radial distance the common envelope projection, which we can do? It's not very large, right? Uh, let's say, I don't know, I, I, I brought here maybe a few hundred AU, maybe a bit less. Uh, and then you take that density cube and with its velocity and its pressure as an internal energy, and you stick it in Astrobear 
in a completely different simulation. And at uh, this point, you probably don't need gravity anymore. And you just let it go. And then you blow some wind in it. The, pro the problem there is, I think that's probably something we do, but you have to make assumptions about time dependence, right? Because everything that's happening in your, your um, small scales is happening also on short scales, right, uh, in general, right? And so long as you've run your simulations of common envelope? Um, like three years. Right, right. And so, um, and typically, you know, sort of uh, what we see for these outbursts are on the orders of hundreds of years. So you just have to make that added assumption that you have, you know, because, right, you're saying, Use what you get from the common envelope simulations on small scales out to maybe 180 or so as boundary conditions or inflow conditions for your large simulations. But then you have to say, how long does this last? And also, now that I say, I say the opposite, okay? I like to say, oh, so you're an idiot. Why are you saying that? Um, Miguel, the answer is that when you look at the common envelope outflows, just very close, right after the common envelope, they're kind of big torques, very fat, not very high density content. If you blow a circular wind in that, you're going to get some kind of pollination. It's going to be electrical. I don't have, we don't have to run it. But the problem is that things are still going on. They'll still be jetting, they'll be in fall, and that's the problem. Right, the fallback uh, is the pollination of an accretion disk around the core, yeah, like what uh, Jason was showing, that can generate an outflow. And so, yeah, I mean, I, this is not, I mean, I'm asking this question not expecting the answers, but to start the discussion, because at least we're finally at the point that we can actually, you know, and we're, we've got a bunch of different codes that people are working on, you know, the SPH and the, the grid base, that we can <coughs> try and, you know, get some answers, and then see where it's where taken. I guess just to follow that, I, I would say, I mean, one of the things would be to have a clear uh, understanding of which scenarios produce which accretion rates, that basic, the basic sort of testing act of that, which binary companions, you know, common envelope, not common envelope, wind growth, <laughs> BHL, growth level overflow, all of these things you can imagine. Because the, the accretion rates are the thing which, you know, then then at that point, whatever jet model you have draws from that as an initial input. And even if so if we knew that basic information about all these scenarios, that would be, you know, something that we could keep up with. Yeah, the accretion rate of the respond at the center of the object. Yeah. You, you can do there's all kinds of either accretion on the secondary, accretion on the primary, or you know, so those are the two things. But yeah, and then depending on the mass of each of those, what do you do? So that could be. Yes, indeed. The type one A supernova they use binary system to bring almost standard candidates, it's not really standard candidate type one. Here we use the variety of binarities to actually give us. And as each planetary nebula is a unique nebula. So, uh, anybody for single star shaping, single star evolution? So, I think it's suicidal. I think about single star evolution, but there's still the type one. The yeah. Well, I mean, that was the, the, the potential that we have to do, to, to show it. But how, that, how else can we explain that? Get more four massive stars out of them. They tend to have probably different kind of binary. Uh, binary. The, the, ratio, the ratio of the envelope mass to the to the stellar mass is, is, large, is larger because you go to 1.52 solar mass star, you lose a little bit, so the envelope is half of this solar mass. More massive star, the envelope is much more massive. And this is of course one uh, difference. The other difference, if you go to stars more massive than two solar mass, they don't expand much of the RGB, but much more of the AGB. Well, stars below two solar mass expand quite a lot of the RGB and can be terminated. But any binary companion lose the mass, a large fraction of the envelope mass, and might form weak or low mass nebula. So there are differences between ma massive and less massive will influence any binary nebula. But we, don't, we didn't explore the three differences. But I think it can't be explained by binary. Everything can be explained. 
No, this is, I mean, it's not just no one waffling in this. This is, you can do a pop synthesis of a seamless kind and see that you go above two solar masses and you will have more common envelope on the, just common envelope as a, the closest type of interaction on the AGB because the low mass get eliminated on the RGB and only the slightly more massive ones will expand further on the AGB and, and just have the interaction. I mean, this is, this is quite well seen. More problematic is the high scale height of the sphere of because um, Albert said the other day uh, that you know, more massive stars can probably do a planetary nebula uh, uh, by themselves without the help of a companion. And one idea would be that the sphericals maybe are those more massive stars. But if they have a very high scale high from the plane, then maybe they should be low mass. And I've heard somebody with the, uh, coming up with the idea that maybe the high scale height of the sphericals is a selection effect due to the fact that we don't see sphericals very far away because they tend to be faint. But I don't know. I mean, I, this remains one of the problems. Yeah, please, uh, more comments, questions? I can put up a plot to... Uh, yeah, John, please. Just a second. I have to find it in the paper, so keep talking. What? <laughs> <laughs> so, can you draw it on the wall? Why don't you draw it It's not, not my plot. <laughs> Anybody else want to show something, please, uh, related to the and shaping? But, uh, really... This is just sort of astronomy 101, um, but it happens to be... It just happens to, to be the case that there was a very nice review paper by Duchesne and Krauss. I hope I have the pronunciation right. Uh, it came out in annual reviews. So here you have the mass, the, sorry, the multiplicity fraction and the companion fraction. So the multiplicity fraction and the companion fraction of stars is a function. I know there are dates available. They're always dates. Um, as a function of stellar mass. So perhaps this answers the question that your odds of finding a companion, and this says nothing about orbital separation, of course, but I guess they're probably buried somewhere else in the paper. There's another figure that shows that. Your odds of finding a companion goes up with, with mass. So this may partly explain why the more massive stars along the galactic plane generate bipolar nebulae more frequently and less massive stars found in my galactic lab Well, these happen in terms of planetary nebulae. They don't have enough time in each universe. It's a very nice paper. Can I ask a question on that one? You can ask a question <laughs> about the plot. Don't have to the answer. I've seen it in the center. Yes, but here, of course, if you have the most time, all the dependents can be lower. If you've got a G-star, it excludes everything that is higher mass as being the, the companion because that was already counted. You count the most massive star as the one that is the primary. Uh, but, so I think that is why this fraction goes up. Uh, but if you go to the planetary nebula phase, that's irrelevant. For both stars will make or can make planetary nebula. And then they should have just uh, the same fraction uh, throughout. If this, uh, if this is a real effect, the problem is not as I don't know. So you can't just scale from the main sequence by reflection about this to the planetary nebula. I guess I missed your first point, Albert. If, if, are you saying that <laughs> are you saying that the lower mass objects are being double counted? No, I, I, th I think if you've got a uh, binary system, they only count uh, the high mass one, the highest mass of the two yes. uh, on the for the stellar mass. Yes. Yeah, so that, that already biases the plot. So the, the mass that is there is that the primary component. Agreed, but isn't that what we need to understand that bipolar nebulae are more likely to be found closer to the point? No. <clears throat> That's not okay. the effect. The dominant effect is the radio. If you do population synthesis, Albert's point is taken into account automatically because you do your binaries. And the, the dominant effect is the fact that the 
lower mass stars extend enormously on the RGB. <coughs> and so they potentially, if they interact, they can take themselves out of the pool. And then more massive ones will. I, I was just going to make a, a small point, which is that I don't think we, I mean, in the absence of a companion, is there any, you know, really a clear, I mean, there's not a clear um, result that says that a spherical object can't make a planetary nebula. I mean, there are arguments about why it might not, but we're, we're not really, I mean, even in the simulations in which binaries are used, if you take off the binary and keep the winds going, and run it through shape, I think you'll still see a spherical planetary nebula from those types of simulations. So there's also effort needed to, yeah, so I mean, if it's, it's perfectly possible still that, it's, that, you know, just the spherical ones are, you know, binaries, maybe more work is needed to really rule that in or out from a first principles point of view, uh, that would be the only <coughs> Let me present something just if you could hold. Uh, so you, you take